My name is Alana Blumenthal, and I am the director of the Brigham City Museums. I would like to thank our guests for attending today's virtual award ceremony for Changes, a juried photography competition. The exhibit is on display now through November 14th at the Brigham City Museum of Art and History. For more information on seeing this exhibit in person or online, please visit our website, brighamcitymuseum.org, or contact us via Facebook, phone, or email. Brigham City Museum of Art and History is a department of the Brigham City Corporation, and this exhibit was made possible thanks in part to the support of the Box Elder Museum Foundation, the Box Elder County Department of Tourism, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, and our community members. It is a privilege to share the virtual stage with this panel of amazing Utah artists. Each of them will have an opportunity to speak about their work in this show and beyond, and then we'll, we will move on to an open discussion. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the comments section, and we will do our best to read them out during the Q&A period at the end of tonight's program. I have a lot I can say about this exhibit and what has, it has meant to our staff, but I'll try to keep it brief. When I first started working here in January, one of the first conversations I had with my team was about the photography competition, then scheduled for the first week of April, and what theme we would choose. Previous shows had focused on technique and composition with titles like light and texture as the artist's prompt. This winter, for a reason I can't even really remember anymore, we decided to go with changes. We had no idea how much meaning that single word would take on soon after that conversation. Everything changed from the dates of the show to the way we hold this award ceremony to, well, just about everything else in the world. It became a broad and relevant topic and the variety of subjects in the nearly 50 submissions we received were a beautiful and timely reflection of that fact. We at the museum are honored to showcase this exhibit full of passion and thoughtfulness on the subject of change. So enough from me. We are fortunate to have the juror of this exhibit with us tonight, and I know he has a lot to say on this year's winners, as well as his own experience in Utah's artistic community. Derek Mellis serves as the production manager for the Utah Film Commission, where he's worked promoting the use of Utah's resources, including crew, cast, and locations by hundreds of film, TV, commercial, and larger still campaigns over the last 13 years. Prior to that, he worked for years as a location scout and manager, as well as the art department in the film industry, working in both Utah and Los Angeles. He has a love and passion for all things photography, and besides the location and landscape work he does for the Utah Film Commission, he also has exhibited his found object constructions in several group shows along the Wasatch Front. He and his wife Mariah and their two children live in Mill Creek, Utah, uh, call Mill Creek, Utah their home. Take it away, Derek. Hi, everyone. Uh, Derek Mellis here. Um, it's a thrill and an honor to be here with you tonight and uh, to talk about this show, Changes. Um, I was uh, very privileged to serve as the jurist for, for the show, and um, I thought it was very fitting that the day I came up to juror the show was the day of the um, a, a huge change across the Wasatch Front with the windstorm that we had a few weeks ago, which was... Uh, um, which required me to drive through, um, you know, overturned semis on the way up to Brigham City from Salt Lake and, um, and really um, seemed very surreal. So um, that was kind of my frame of mind coming into the show, but I was uh, pleased and um, uh, somewhat taken aback by how strong all of the work was. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um, some of the uh, landscape photography, which is I, I'm a huge fan of all the macro work, um, the um, some of the digital work, some of the portrait uh, photography um, was just really, really great stuff. Um, I, but I, you know, you have to pick a winner. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to, to get to choose three. Um, I guess maybe I should talk a little bit about my background 
Um, as um, Alana mentioned, I'm uh, the production manager for the Utah Film Commission. Worked in uh, film prior to that. Um, and uh, prior to that, I actually worked as a portrait photographer for um, a national company called PCA. Um, it was uh, first job out of college. I was uh, uh, forced to drive to all the Kmarts in the Intermountain West and uh, set up a photography studio uh, for a week at a time and um, take portrait, photogra photo or portrait photography of whomever came in. Um, it was uh, a really great way for me to see the country. Um, it was a really great way for me to explore the state, you know, spending a week at a time in a town like Richfield or St. George or Minot, North Dakota. Um, and it kind of prepared me for my current role with the Film Commission, which is to um, help film and television and commercial productions find um, locations that are often cheated for somewhere else here in Utah. Um, but it, um, anyway, that's, I, I don't want to go on too, too long, but uh, maybe we should start talking about uh, some, of the, some of the other artists. So um, actually there's one other thing, should I share my screen now and kind of talk a little bit more about that? Thanks, Alana. Um, so we have uh, the work that we do with the Film Commission is uh, if you haven't, you should definitely take a moment to check out our website, film.utah.gov. And uh, if you click on uh, locations at the top, you'll be taken to the location um, library. Um, and we have over 1,444 locations right now of various areas throughout the state. And this is, this is the paint I use to help lure people here to film. So uh, they'll send us oftentimes a script or um, perhaps mood boards from a, a campaign or a commercial. And they'll try and match those through using these locations. But I thought I'd just do a quick example of, you can uh, do a search in here by city. Um, let's just do Brigham City. And I'll show you a quick, Example of, um, oh, there it goes. Uh, while I was up there that day, um, I was fortunate enough to go and take photos of the Brig Brigham Academy Center, um, which you can see on here. But if you, um, if any of you get the chance, so if you want to explore our sites, uh, maybe hit your hometown. Um, we're always open to getting more photographs. Um, you know, people can, we now have a service where you can actually upload your photos of your home or your business um, to be considered as a filming location. Um, that's this page here. Um, just kind of type in your information and upload up to 10 photos and a photo credit. And um, you can do this, you know, if, if you notice, a, you say a landscape, location or something that we might be missing, um, feel free to, to utilize the service. It, it only helps us out. So um, I know that I'm not segueing very well, but um, I was asked to show just a little bit of my, my art and I thought um, I would do so. My, originally when I um, started exhibiting my photography, I was really into um, Polaroids at the time, which are kind of hard to show in a fine art show. And um, those, I started adding other things to the frames and then the frames sort of became boxes and the boxes sort of became other things I collected. And, um, but they all sort of had that element of photography in them in some way, shape or form. But uh, this is a found object construction. Um, I did call the Behave State. Um, here's another one called, um, myth of uh, Sisyphus. I think that might be a joy cam photo down there if I remember correctly. Um, and then um, I wanted to show you this one too. It's the called the layer of the white hair. So. 
we're not seeing we're still seeing the uh, website screen we're not seeing the oh article. i'm so sorry um let me that maybe happens I sometimes back out of this yeah okay and then share again no it worked so well in the beginning so sorry <laughs> um i'll just show these very quickly then um this is the one called the behave state um uh, mostly found objects with a little bit of photography in there as well. Um, and then this one is one, uh, sorry, called uh, Myth of Sisyphus. And this is the one that I referenced that has the Joy Cam photo at the bottom there. And um, finally, the uh, layer of the white hair, which is a uh, mostly found object piece. All right, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> that is great. Thank you so much, Derek, for sharing um, your art with us, for, for sharing the information about your work with the Film Commission and all the interesting ways that people can get involved. And, and of course, for um, sharing your time with us and donating your time to, to jury this exhibit. Really appreciate uh, having you involved in this show. Thank you, it was an honor, thanks. Um, so next, we will hear from the photographer of this year's first place winning entry titled Dementia. Anita Early Schley is a professional artist from Springville, Utah. She employs photography, painting, and mixed media as outlets for her artistic vision. Anita attended un the University of Utah and received a BFA in studio art. For nearly 30 years, she has been showing her work through various galleries and publications. She's married to another artist, Kevin Schley. She also enjoys reading, baking, gardening, wandering around beautiful landscapes, her cats, and pretending to sing opera loudly around the house, much to the embarrassment of her children. Nita, you and I have a lot of hobbies in common. <laughs> um, this photography competition encouraged her to explore her fears. Dementia is a black and white multi-exposure photo depicting blurred figures surrounded, surrounding a single person in focus. Its subject's condition is laid to bear and tells a striking story. Anita has created something deeply personal and in doing so has encouraged the viewer to reflect on and often to share with us their own sense of connection to the piece. This is the power of great art. Anita, I'd love to hear a few words from you about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Am I coming through? Is everything good? <laughs> here you All right. Awesome. Here, I, I'm going to show the photograph here. See if I can get that to work. There, is that up there? Is that working? All right. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, the reason why I, I've had this photograph in my mind for about a year. It was something that I wanted to do. And when I saw the theme for this show, I actually made this photograph specifically for this show in mind because it was perfect. It just fit this idea that I had and it gave me sort of the opportunity, the, the vehicle to actually uh, produce this photograph that I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, dementia is sadly something that runs in my family and has been in my family for generations and I've seen uh, the effects of it and it, it's heartbreaking you know it's a difficult thing to go through and because it is something that has happened you know so many generations um, it's something that I fear for myself if I'm being perfectly honest you know it's I feel like there's a ticking time bomb over my head for when this will begin to affect me. I mean, I hope I'm, it doesn't, but, you know, I guess my genes and my, you know, aren't on my side in this one. And so, you know, what I tried to do with this photograph, I used, I, I um, studied photography way before the digital age. And so I, I, you know, my, I'm a traditional, I guess, photographer is what you'd call it. And so this, you know, employs a lot of traditional, even though this was taken digitally on a digital camera, um, and employs a lot of traditional methods with, you know, multiple exposures and a slow shutter speed. And so what is happening, you know, in this image, I wanted to get the feeling of confusion that comes from the person who's experiencing a dementia. You know, I've seen it where, you know, people are trying to connect, 
you know, especially loved ones, people who love the person that's going through this. And they're trying to connect on a personal level, but there's just, um, it's met with a kind of confusion, really, you know, maybe not a recognition of who that person is, or maybe mixing who the person is up, or this kind of, what's even worse is the feeling, you know, where you see, where a person knows they should be remembering something, but can't, and it's almost a, a fear, I guess, that you see in them, and it's just, you know, something that I wouldn't wish on anyone and sadly something that I've, you know, had to witness myself. And so that's what this, this photograph is about, that kind of confusion. You know, you see people that are, you know, crouching and trying to interact with this person, but, you know, from this person's perspective, it's not clear exactly what's, what's going on and who these people are. And it can just seem like a lot of noise in a way, whether visual or, or, or not. How I, um, so it was pretty, it was, it's an emotional piece for me. This, this, these are models. This is my family that are modeling. No one in this uh, picture is actually um, experiencing dementia, but this is, you know, members of my family and we all know what that's like and with some of the previous generations, I guess, in here. It's my children and, and my husband who are my models. How I took this, you know, technically how I took this photograph was um, using, you know, implementing a slow shutter speed, anywhere from 10 to 15 to 30 seconds, you know, trying to get something. And I can't remember which one. I think this one was a 15 second exposure. And for those of you that aren't familiar with photography, you know, doing a slow shutter, you know, you get that blurred movement. And so because I wanted to capture some of these individuals, you know, to get kind of ghosty images, they actually held still for a few seconds and then would move, actually walk in and out of the frame. And how I finally managed to do this, you know, cause <laughs> it's kind of funny is that everyone had to do it backwards. I, you know, in order to get it to turn out, we started the photograph with everyone crouched. And then, you know, after a couple of seconds, then everyone backed up and walked away. And it was the only way to get that kind of freeze, you know, look. So even though in the, and it's supposed to be that they're approaching and hopefully it, you know, comes off as if they're approaching the subject, in order to get the photograph to actually work, we had to do it backwards. So it was a lot of, okay, everyone, and then everybody <laughs> walked backwards out of the frame. And so that's kind of technically how I, I, I did this photograph. And it's, you know, naturally lit by the window and, and in the room there too. Um, let me see, I'll go out of this sharing screen here. All right, is that gone now? Hopefully, okay. <laughs> All right, and about myself as a photographer, um, as I said before, I studied at the University of Utah. Um, this was in the early 90s that I went to the school out there. And so I, I have a very traditional darkroom film, you know, that's where my, my love of photography came from. Um, I actually consider myself a bit of a mixed media artist because as was said, I, I'm not just a photographer. I do a lot of painting, drawing, combining of the two more often than not. I, I'm gonna actually pick up my laptop here and, and show you a few things, if that's all right. Um, let's see, whoops, let me get around. I don't know if you could see this piece here. Is that working? Let me see what's in the screen there. Get my hair out of it, that would help. Um, this piece is actually a combination. It's a, an alternative photo process called gum printing. That's the leaf in the background but then the bird has been painted on this picture here. A lot of these other images, believe it or not, are also photographs. They're all doing a, a photographic process that was done in the 1800s. I don't know if we can see some of this very well. I'm checking. Um, again, called gum printing. This is liquid light. You can see that in here. So I employ a lot of uh, painterly things, even within uh, my photography. Something that um, I, I do a lot of the, the gum printing into that, you know, again, this is an old process, an old, you know, the photographers are trying to figure out color photography. And so this was something that was invented in the 1800s. And I love it because it gives a, a very 
a painter because you're actually painting your emulsion, creating your emulsion and painting it on paper and then contact printing it. So it gives a very painterly look, even though it is a, actually a photograph. Um, so I do that quite a bit and I enjoy that and I like to do some mixed media. For this particular image though, I, I went with a traditional photograph because I wanted to um, give an element of realness. It's about something that's very real to me, real to my family something uh, that is very much a part of my life. And that's something that I love about photography. It's this ability to capture, you know, that moment in time. And so I went with a, a traditional photograph rather than a gum print or some of the other things that I did for this particular piece. But yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anita. Um, that's really interesting about the gum printing, and I'd love to see more of your work um, in that style. And um, again, thank you for sharing such a, a personal uh, image like dementia. Um, we, we, we really love it. Uh, so you. to move on, um, our second place piece, Progressions, is by Lonnie Oldenthal Newby. Lonnie is the associate editor of the Box Elder News Journal and a born and raised Brigham City local. She is a graduate of Southern Utah University where she earned her bachelor's degree in theater arts and has since used those skills to act like she knows what she's doing in life. She's the <laughs> proud mom of three amazing kids who keep her on her toes. She brings an illustrative style to her photography, combining the candid aspects of photojournalism with traditional portrait posing techniques. She represents people through portraiture that reflects their reality with a little extra boost of dramatic flair. She describes it as life magnified through careful storytelling. Using a candid approach, she captures genuine interaction and with selective direction, she helps to refine posing and the setting to take the experience and end images up to an artistic moment. Lonnie chose to detail her experience living through the coronavirus lockdown with her entries this year. Progression is a magical photo that captures the visceral feeling of self-exploration through music. And I think we're gonna share that up for you, Lonnie, while you talk a little Thank bit you. about your work. Okay. Well, I'm going to start kind of at the beginning because I feel like it's important to get to where this photo is. Um, so I started photography as sideline hobby uh, to document my kids growing up. And shortly thereafter, I became one of those moms that's like, oh, I'm going to be a photographer. <laughs> and I started taking clients on probably well before I was ready. But I started to incorporate elements of my education. So I was a theater person. Um, that's my background. And I was able to use all of these elements like lighting, costumes, um, direction to create really kind of magical scenes. And the people who were really early on when I was super passionate got really custom portrait sessions and it was amazing because it was over the top and I really uh, tried too hard. And so <laughs> over the years, you know, initially I was shooting so that I could earn enough money to buy the next gear, to buy the next studio equipment. You know, I had strobes and continuous lights and you know like I had anything and everything I went to all the classes and went to the workshops and the WPPI all of the things and as I really got absorbed into that whole industry and that community like I started to lose myself I started to become everybody else and you know when people were telling me how to do things right, it just looked like their work and not mine. And so when life shifted and changed and I became a single mom and I moved to a market that could not support what I was charging. <laughs> and so when I, when I moved here and saw how saturated the market was and how unstable that was, I was like, I put it away. You know, I just withdrew from photography as a whole. And it took about a year before I ended up 
getting the job of the newspaper and working with that. And I was coming from such a post-processing world where I refined everything and perfected everything. And then to shoot in a photojournalistic style where you couldn't touch it. You know, you have to stay raw. You have to stay true. It was like this whole shift for me. And so I started to pull back and slowly but surely, like more equipment went into storage and more, you know, like I just put it all away. And now I'm at a place where everything is like more simple, as simple as I can make it, um, the more fulfilling it is. And the more I can just let life happen, the more I'm proud of my work. And so um, I hadn't entered anything into any competitions in a really long time, like years. And when this one came around, I was like, mm, I don't know, maybe let's. Mm. But I decided that if I was going to do it, I was going to push myself because that is something that I've been doing to find that joy again in shooting because it was gone for a really long time. I was so burned out. And so I had to give myself permission to suck for a while. And so like I started doing astrophotography, which I had no business doing. And now I really love that. And I love being able to go out under the stars and just live for a minute and enjoy it. And if I capture something fantastic, but if not, I had that moment. And um, so for this, I was like, okay, what, what's my next thing? What do I want to be able to refine and capture and figure out how to do? And so I had done a lot on the post-processing end before with multiple exposures. I had never shot it in camera. And so that was my like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing this. And so I wanted to go with the theme and for me, changes in regard to coronavirus was, you know, a complete social shutdown. And uh, so everything in this image is my little room and my little world. And, you know, at the age of 37, I was like, hey, you know what? I always wanted to learn to play an instrument. I've never actually tried. So let's do this. And so I've been playing for about a year and like, I fell in love with my guitar. I am not good, you guys, but I fell in love with this. And so when I was trying to think of a subject, initially I was shooting my kids and doing self portraits because I'm cooperative. Um, but I, was thinking about how much music has helped me survive. You know, as a single parent in the coronavirus, like it's a lonely, hard time. And um, so I, I shot my guitar in boudoir style, <laughs> like trying to accentuate the curves and, and just pay tribute to something that helped me stay sane. And so um, this is a multiple exposure. It actually, you know, again, I've minimized, minimized gear. And so I, I normally, I shoot on a Canon 60 and I almost always have a 24 to 105 on just as a utility lens. So I, I shot with that, um, didn't bother pulling out any ring lights or anything. This is my dusty lamp that's up here. That's what I used to light this. I shot it literally right here on my bed. So I, you know, I don't have, I used to have this in-home studio, the whole shebang. And this was just the complete opposite of that for me. But like, it's as close to a uh, self-portrait as an inanimate object can be. Wow, what a what a beautiful sentiment, Lonnie. I really like that. And and thank you so much for for sharing that journey with us. I think that there's a lot in there that people can relate to, you know, one aspect yeah. or another that uh, we've all been through something like that at some point in our lives and probably within the last year. So yeah, for <laughs> <thank sure. you. laughs> 
Um, so third place this year went to Cindy McConkey for her piece, Metamorphosis. Cindy is a photographer, an artist, a runner, a gardener, an outdoor enthusiast, an educator, and a caregiver. She is a mother of four, a grandmother of four, and wife to Wayne. She's hiked the Grand Canyon from rim to rim, run the Boston Marathon, grown 40 pound watermelons in her backyard, wow, um, seen the ocean freeze in Helsinki, Finland, cared for children with special needs, and watched a loved one pass away. She's a USU graduate and a student of life. Her camera has accompanied her every step of the way. She is an adjunct photo instructor at BYU-Idaho and works in the functional skills classroom at Box Elder High School. She graduated summa cum laude from Utah State with a BFA in art with an emphasis in photography with departmental honors and honors in university studies. A longtime supporter of the museum, Cindy says she looks forward to participating in our competitions. Metamorphosis is an ethereal self-portrait expressed beautifully through a sepia-toned multi-exposure. It is an unflinching yet compassionate depiction of a personal journey when despair leads to soul searching and ultimately to new strength. So I'll let you take it from there, Cindy. Thanks, Alana. Um, I hope people can see me. We have some remodeling projects going on in our house and the room I'm in um, isn't very well lit and as the sun's going down, <laughs> I'm finding myself in the dark. But <laughs> so, um, just wanted to start with a little bit about how I came to photography. I kind of came to photography a little bit later in life. I went back to school when my youngest child was in kindergarten and I thought that I would study graphic design. And photo one is one of those classes that all of the art students have to take and I kind of kept putting that one off. I didn't take it until um, the start of my second year up at Utah State and everything in that class just came together so perfectly. It was like a, a very life-changing experience for me. Um, our professor um, was Craig Law and he had just come back from sabbatical. He was ahead of the, the photo department but he was teaching this class and he had two new grad students that he was um, showing how to how to teach a class that they could teach later. So we had three really excited teachers. Um, and the people in the class were from all different um, majors, but everybody worked together. It was one of those really amazing learning experiences where everybody worked together to push each other to be better. It wasn't a competitive thing, but just a, a wanting everybody to succeed and do well. And it was just amazing to me in that way to learn and grow with other people, but also the way it changed my life and um, opened my eyes up to see light. Um, I saw how light could take the most ordinary thing and made it extraordinary and just really made me so much more grateful um, for my life and for all of the things in my life. And um, it's something I love to share with other people. So I'm glad that I can do that as a teacher, um, even with my functional skills kids in the morning when I'm getting them off the bus, if I see something. <laughs> or see some light that I type of light in the sky that I think is amazing. I need to, to sh share that with them. So, um, you know, after taking, you know, photo one, I, of course, changed my major <laughs> and decided <laughs> that I would be a photo major. Um, then since graduating um, from Utah State, um, you know, I really love doing shows like this to kind of keep you going, keep you um, coming up with ideas. I feel like um, little shows like this are kind of like um, writing a, a narrative or you know a, a short essay and um, bigger shows are, are kind of like writing a novel and take a little bit longer for your project and your work and your ideas to evolve um, and I've been fortunate enough since I graduated um, to have some solo exhibitions I showed it my first show was at the, the gallery um, at the Salt Lake City Library it's a very beautiful space there um, and I've had some shows at Art Access and Bountiful Davis um, Recently had a show at the Riverside um, Library in Salt Lake as well. Um, and I just love that process of, you know, working through an idea and um, kind of seeing it to this, this you know, evolve. Because it seems like a lot of times, you know, you have this idea and you want to make this project. And at first, it's not really what, what you expect. You know, you, you start putting these ideas together and then you show somebody it and they're like, their reaction is not <laughs> what you were hoping for. And you're like wow, that, that doesn't work, I need to go back to the drawing board. Um, so some of my ideas, especially with the body of work, have taken you know, a couple years to evolve and grow. 
Um, this piece of the museum, fortunately, didn't, didn't take that long. Um, you know, I kind of really wanted to go with that idea of um, finding a voice. I'm kind of a more quiet, soft-spoken person, and finding a voice is sometimes um, hard for me, both kind of figur figuratively and literally to be heard by people. Um, and I didn't really want to make it a self-portrait, but I think in the end, that's probably made it more successful. Um, you know, I usually have used my kids as models, but they're all have grown and have left the house and with COVID, you know, it wasn't as easy to find a model. So I, I went with um, with myself as the model for, for the piece. And then I wanted to, um, you know, somehow make that into an image that changed. Let's see, I can do some screen sharing here and show you the, the pictures. So this is the, the first image, the self-portrait. And that was actually shot with um, film. And it was a negative film, and then it was processed as slide film. So it's a cross-processed image, which gives it that kind of um, interesting color. And you can do that digitally, but with film, film has its own color tones. So to be able to, to do that with the film, you just kind of get a better look, a better, better color. Kind of a surprise of it, too. You don't know exactly what you're going to get until, <laughs> until you, you get that film developed. So I started with the the color film like that and then I scanned it in and cleaned up the negative um, and then next I wanted to have uh, something with the leaves and the veins kind of to go through it and so I went out and uh, took a picture this one was a digital picture and that's the leaf picture here and you know, I tried a lot of different leaves because um, I was a certain type of leaf I was looking for a certain kind of look I really wanted that real fine detail in the veins and that. And so I don't have a macro lens, but I have extension tubes, which are, you know, work like a macro lens, but are much cheaper because I don't have any glass in them. So I went out and was shooting different leaves in my yard, maple leaves, rosebud leaves, <laughs> different leaves, and none of them were, were quite right. And then I could see, you know, the backlighting coming through the grapevines on our fence. And I thought, oh, that's what I'm looking for. So I got one of the grape leaves and then kind of set up a little thing on my table outside to get the light the way I wanted it to. And, and shot that. And then um, I converted that to black and white and then overlaid it onto the to this image to come up with the final self-portrait there. And it worked out you know quite nicely. Um, when I when I overlaid it, I thought, well, I didn't really need to, to do a lot with it. I thought maybe I might want to, you know, erase some of the lines in some places, but I, I really liked the way it came together. So I just just left it the way it was there. So, um, yeah, so I don't, I guess I could show you guys. So I just um, shot that with a 50 millimeter lens. So it's a real small lens. And then the extension tubes are just, they're just hollow like that. And it's just, they come apart. I just have two of those into the 50 millimeter lens and be able to get those really close sh shots, like the macro on the, the leaf there. So, and, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Any questions on that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Cindy. I think that's, that's very interesting. And that actually, you know, that transitions into a couple of the questions we'll, we'll get to. Um, I just quickly like to take a moment to also acknowledge our Merit Award winners who aren't on this call tonight, but um, those were Randy Rapp, Brent Lindsay, and Michael Goats. Um, and of course, all of the artists in this year's show uh, that made Derek's decision very difficult. Um, it's a good problem to have and we really appreciate everyone who participated. All of the photos in this show are, are really wonderful and, and we hope that the people watching will come in and see them in person. Um, so now I'm going to turn to a couple of questions and, and these are open to any or all of you. There are certain topics that often come up when guests come through the exhibit. So figured I'd just uh, shoot those out and give people in the chat time to get their questions in before the end as well. So um, Cindy, you had the perfect transition. You were talking about um, the lenses you use. I think all of you talked in some way or another about equipment and what you chose to use, what you chose not to use, what techniques you like. But that's the number one question we get from, from people is just, you know, what 
not just what did you use for this photo, but also kind of how did your choices of equipment change? Like Lonnie, you said you go, you went from more to less. So uh, as you went from starting out to the point you're at now, how have your thoughts on equipment and technique changed? And I'll let anyone jump in on this one. I guess I'll, I'll talk about that. <laughs> well, with me, it was mostly time. You know, I, you know, I've been around as a photographer. I, like I said before, I started out with film and I still have my film cameras, still occasionally, you know, shoot film with the uh, alternative processes that I was talking about. They are um, enlarged negatives that you use in order to, to do that. And, um, you know, because I do different things and I'm a multimedia artist, um, it really, you know, what I use or what I go for really just depends on what it is that I'm trying to get. Uh, for this, like digitally, I shoot a Canon um, film cameras. We have Nikon and I have this really old uh, Minolta camera, actually, film camera that um, was the first camera that I, I ever used. And um, I still have it and I still love it. It's a wonderful camera. <laughs> But, you know, times change and as they, you know, progress and, you know, there's different things. Film has a quality that um, digital just doesn't have. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, I like to go back to the what's now, I guess, old school. <laughs> but um, we'll do that. But there are certain advantages to digital, too. I mean, that immediacy. You know, it's not like going in the dark room and processing your film and then coming out and discovering, oh man, that didn't work out, you know, or something. So, you know, it is wonderful. There, you know, there, I guess to say, you know, I, I do it all and it just really is kind of image specific, I guess. You know, what I'm trying to get with this particular image. I don't use a studio, I don't have a studio. My husband is actually a professional photographer and he does do a lot of studio equipment and has strobe lights and, and, and a lot of things. Um, but because my, my work tends to be more um, conceptual and, and that sort of thing, I, I like to use a lot of uh, natural light and what's available and, and get, you know, that mood that sort of, you know, along with that. So, you know, <laughs> I guess it just really depends on what it is that I'm going for in that feeling. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Cindy, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Or Oh, yes, I agree with Anita. I started with the, um, the dark room too, and I have a dark room in my basement. Um, and there are things that you just can't get with the digital, but there are some of those advantages to digital too, where you, know, you don't have to wait through all these processes and days to find out that what you did didn't work, <laughs> that your film wasn't ruined, or you didn't, you know, you didn't shoot it with the right exposures or whatever. So, yeah, it's kind of, kind of that way. Um, I also, um, I really like to print my own things, even though I do work digitally. I have a, a professional printer, so I can get my colors the way I want to, to have them. Um, um, with like a neat, I, I like Canons. I shoot a Canon camera. <laughs> and then my, I, my film cameras, I have an Olympus OM-1 that my husband had since he was, I think, 18. So <laughs> I use that quite a bit. And then I have a little Yashica that's a medium format camera I inherited from my mother-in-law. So that's kind of fun. It shoots um, two and a quarter so the, um, so the negatives are square, square um, images, which is fun. So, yeah. So um, an, uh, kind of on that subject, you said that sometimes the process or, or the equipment you use depends on the subject. So how do you find you decide what you want to shoot? Where does the inspiration come from? Do you go out, do you find that you go out looking for something or do you just kind of tote your camera along with you and, and uh, snap what, what comes to you? Where, where do you, you get your inspiration to, to, to focus on something? Um, well, for me, I, the idea usually comes first. You know, I'll have the idea. So it's a very intentional thing rather than going out and photo. But I do that sometimes too. Uh, you know, I'm not a landscape photographer, but I do sometimes. I mean, you know, go out and we'll shoot. And so I will, you know, go out and look for things to shoot. But 
typically um, there's an idea that that I want to express or do. And so it's very intentional, you know, setting up, you know, waiting for, you know, I talked about, I use a lot of natural light. And so that means waiting for time of day or, um, or even sometimes weather conditions, you know, if the weather isn't cooperating just right or, you know, those sorts of things and setting up the mood that I want and, you know, posing or whatever. So it's very intentional. It's rather than, you know, going and looking for something to photograph more often than not, it's, I've already thought it out in my mind. And so I'm preparing and setting up the scene, I guess. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And I think for me, um, I literally tote my camera everywhere with me at all times because I use it in my nine to five. Uh, and so my children are so used to me pulling over to shoot things that, you know, like sometimes I'm like, no, I have to, like, I have to. And so I do set out to shoot specific projects, but a lot of what I shoot just is things that I see, you know, like things I see and I just go, oh, I need that. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I need that. And eventually it'll become part of something. I think I'm kind of like Lonnie. I like to take my camera everywhere and my family gets a little tired of it. So I've gotten really good at taking photos really quickly so I can catch up with them because they're like, we're on vacation or we're on a hike. We don't want to wait for you to take photos. So gotten really quick like at doing that type of thing. And you know, whether it's insects in my yard or you know, anywhere we go to travel or visit. But if I'm doing something more for a conceptual piece and it's usually very well planned out. Um, you know, I like to do a lot of um, close-ups of color and light and abstracts. And so those are very, something I really plan out and, and set up and get the right natural light for the shoot. Or I do um, some blurred imagery of running. And a lot of my images all kind of come back to, to running. Even my uh, color abstracts I started with some, some running images that I, I took at school when I was up at Utah State that I really didn't like because people thought they looked like running and they're like, we well, don't like running, running is awful. <laughs> and I wanted to convey the feeling of running, which led to my abstract color photos. But yeah, if it's something more conceptual. I think I really kind of plan it out and there's a lot of trial and error and evolution of the project as we go along. So. And um, final question from me, I think, and it looks like we're getting a few in the chat, but um, what would you say, I'm um, hoping we've got some people watching uh, who have an interest in photography, maybe they did it in college, maybe they only just started doing it on their phone, but if someone has an interested interest in photography, um, what would you say to them about getting more involved either with, um, with a local club or, or with exhibiting something like this? Uh, what, what words of inspiration do you have for folks thinking about getting more involved in it? I, I'll go. Um, so here in Box Elder County, we have a Box Elder County Photographers Group on Facebook, and it's open to anyone who shoots in the county. You don't have to reside in the county. Uh, and every now and then we get together and shoot. We haven't been as active lately, but if more people come, then maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that some of my best friendships have started bonding over art. And so I think more than anything just don't be afraid to talk to someone if someone shoots something incredible and you're like mind blown talk to them about it find out what they're doing and you know obviously don't sit there and pick their brain for every little aspect that you can pull off the xf data but you know like talk to other artists that's the most helpful thing is just talk to people who inspire you to get out and shoot more Also, um, I could say that I, I'm uh, an advocate for education. You know, I take a class. It doesn't have to be, you know, a college class or whatever. There's lots of community. I've taught several community photography classes over the years. And so, you know, take a class. That way you, ha you can have 
there's so much, you know, photography is sort of deceptively simple seeming, but you know, it's, there's a lot involved in it. And so I think taking a class really gets into a lot of those nitty gritties and, you know, and, and really, you know, helps you to learn what you're doing. Plus you have, hopefully, you know, your teacher is someone who's experienced who you can actually sit, you know, with and, and learn and ask questions and, you know, there's so many things available, you know, for any sort of, you know, price points up from, you know, like going to college or, you know, taking a, a community class or, or maybe you can even find a mentorship or something, you know, with somebody, apprentice with somebody. I think there's a lot of options, but I think um, using that, you know, experience and getting a, some kind of a, an education in it is, I think, very helpful. And a lot of times it will help, um, I think, gets you moving in the right direction because it's a wonderful skill that once you learn it, you can just really take off and, and do so much and learn so much on your own once you get that sort of foundation and everything. So I think, you know, take a class. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. You know, don't, don't feel intimidated. And at any age, you know, it doesn't matter young or, or old, you know, take a class. You'd be surprised, you know, how the variety of age groups and classes. So I, I you know, take a class. It's, they're, they're a lot of fun. And so I'm a big advocate for that. Yes, I agree with that, with taking the class. I think that you can take a nice, you know, photo with your cell phone. I mean, lots of people do, but um, to really be able to get creative and, and, and use your, your skills to really make something happen, it's good to know how to use a camera and to be able to use those manual, you know, modes on the, on the camera. And so I think classes are great. Um, I've even had in my class this last year, I've had a couple of people in their 60s, you know, later 60s taking the class and, you know, the technology is a little bit hard for them at first, but then the learning curve just really goes fast and, and they just really, um, it's fun to see them, you know, find something even at that age that they're really passionate about and, and get out and kind of have this new childlike, you know, view of the world. So, so yeah, you know, take a class and join a club and go out and shoot. So. That's all really good advice, and I'm seeing in the chat they're already throwing in le links to the local camera clubs and stuff, and I'll just add my own little plug so we already know what the theme of next year's photo show is going to be. It's going to um, be waterways or something connected to water because we're doing it in partnership with a Smithsonian on Ma Main Street exhibit that will be here in the Bear River Heritage area at that same time. So get inspired now, <laughs> get ready, uh, take the class, um, join the club and be ready for uh, this time next year to, to submit your show on the theme of, of our natural aquatic habitat. Um, so just, I wasn't going to say anything about that tonight, but that seemed like a good time to put a little plug in for that. Um, so uh, we are getting questions, and actually one of the questions we did get, so that's a rare one where we're set in stone on the theme, but what kind of themes would you all be interested in, in seeing us put out for, for future competitions? Do, do you, or let me, let me narrow that question down. Do you like the idea in the past we had done, like I said in my introduction, things um, that focused more on technique, ideas like light, texture, or do you like the more kind of ephemeral idea, changes, or I don't know what another example of that would be, um, which, which kind of inspires you more? For me, I've said it, you know, multiple times, but I'm, I'm a conceptual artist in, in my heart. So, you know, like these sort of themes, you know, changes, and that, you know, that speaks to me personally on a personal level. But, you know, that's, that's me. There's so many different artists and, and peoples and passions that, but that's, that's what I like. I like telling stories. So that's where I, where I find my passion. <laughs> yes. I like the conceptual idea too, because I think that, um, you know, something that everybody brings their own story to when they come to look at your photo and so they can, you know, take something different from it. Everybody can have, you know, a different feeling or a different inspiration from it rather than, rather than something that maybe is just very, you know, literal, so. I'm an out there person, I always think, you know, whatever is going to be open to exploration and let people just kind of be and do so 
that works for me conceptually. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate having you all to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Derek. <laughs> oh, no, no, I was, I, I'm a conceptual artist too. And, and I think, yeah, yeah, I agree with the group here. So <laughs> same thing. I swear someone else asked that, but since I had you here and could put you on the spot, that does help us <laughs> for planning future exhibits, not just photography, but also um, we, we do other uh, theme submission uh, jury shows throughout the year. So, so I appreciate that feedback. Um, at this point, I'm going to throw it to, Marianne or Jennifer who have been monitoring the chat, see if there are any other uh, good questions that have come up before uh, we, we run out of time. Looks like you guys have done a really good job answering everybody's questions. <laughs> so Mr. McConkie did want to comment on Cindy McConkie's beautiful model in her photograph. So cute. <laughs> I, I have a question for Cindy, actually. Did, did you cross process your own film in your dark room or did you take it into a lab? Um, I cross processed it myself, yeah. Oh, so some, some of the films got stuck together, some of the negatives got ruined, <laughs> but there were enough good ones. So <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Anything else, folks? I, I, I really want to thank uh, you so much again for sharing your time and experience with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank those of you who joined via Facebook Live. If you missed any part of this or would like to watch the recording, it will be available on Brigham City Museum's Facebook, YouTube, and web pages. If you are watching this recording after the fact, you can still feel free to add comments below as we will continue to monitor them. And as you can see, these artists are, are very approachable and I'm, I'm sure would be happy any questions that we didn't get to um, in the live stream. Please make sure to check out, uh, we're, we're throwing links in the chat. We'll also throw any uh, links that the artists want out there um, to their work and where you can find their work. So, so please check out the links provided by the artist to see more about their art. As I said at the beginning of our event uh, tonight, you can see this show now through November 14th. We are open Tuesdays through Saturdays. Admission is free and guided tours are available on request. Our next exhibit will be a juried design and craft art show on the theme Design of the Times, followed by our annual wintertime plein air competition. If you're interested in more information on these exhibits and how to, or how to submit your work, please reach out to us. Um, same goes, as I said, that little plug um, for next year's photography exhibit already. So if you have any questions about getting involved with our local arts jury shows, please reach out to us. We'd love uh, to see what you can do. Um, you can follow the Brigham City Museums on social media for up-to-date information on more upcoming programs, both online and in-house. And we are trying to also get this exhibit up virtually like we did with our last quilt show um, for people who can't make it in in person at this time. Um, all of that said, thank you for joining us for our first ever virtual award <laughs> ceremony. Um, good night and everybody be well. <laughs>